Okay, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us for a conversation between artist Christina Forer and writer, writer Sabrina Ora Mark as part of Christina Forer's current exhibition at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, which is Matrix 187, on view until January 2nd of 2022. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the exhibition funders, the Kobe Foundation, and the Wadsworth Athenaeum's Contemporary Coalition. I am Patricia Hickson, the Emily Hall Tremaine Curator, Curator of Contemporary Art at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's program, a conversation between a visual artist and a writer whose work intersects in numerous ways, including ideas related to family, fairy tales, and human emotions. Christina Forer is a Los Angeles-based artist who was born and raised in Zurich, Switzerland. She creates tapestries, paintings, drawings, and more recently, sculpture, depicting vivid and complex scenes of conflict and anxiety. Violence, torture, and aggression pair with humor and fantasy in colorful compositions that straddle the world of fairy tales and real life. In her Matrix, Matrix exhibition, Forer has paired her own tapestries and drawings with related objects from the Wadsworth's collections. She curated the objects to connect through her own work uh, with various themes, including textile traditions, mythological narratives, familial interactions, folk art and folklore, and man's problematic relationship with the natural world. Sabrina Ora Mark is the author of the poetry collections, The Babies and Simpson, uh, Wild Milk, right here. Uh, Wild Milk is her first book of fiction, recently out from Dorothy, a publishing project. Happily, her collection of essays on fairy tales and motherhood, which began as a monthly column in the Paris Re Review, is a forthcoming publication from Random House, which will be released in early 2023. You can read more about her work at www.sabrinaoramark.com. The program will unfold as follows. Uh, Christina will present a few slides from her Matrix exhibition. Then Sabrina will share one of her stories and then they'll have a conversation together, hopefully leaving a little time for some questions. So please put your questions in the chat and we're in for a real treat. So uh, welcome Sabrina, welcome Christina and um, take it away, Christina. Hello, everyone. Hello, Patty, and hello, Sabrina. I'm really um, thrilled to be talking to you. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, I wanted to start really quickly talking about a few pieces that are in the Matrix show. And I want to start with one piece that is called Sepulchre. And um, this is a really, it looks very tiny here, I always think, but it's gigantic. It's 97 by 162 inches, which is 14 feet across and I don't know, eight feet high. And it is based on a morning sampler, which is something that people used to make when they were sad and mourning a person. And I, I, I always thought of it as a nice way to kind of stay with a person and um, spend time with them through an action. So this is how it started. And it kind of turned into something entirely different and not to explain too many things, but here is the morning person. And here would be the vessel with the dead person in it. I don't know if, if you can see my cursor. I hope you can. And um, there's just lots of things happening. There is a mansion burning, there are winds talking. Um, just everything is connected and um, hopefully kind of talks to each other, but also separate and isolated in, in, this, in this way. Here we have this couple and they are pulling and they were inspired by the great big turnip story, which is a story where 
a turnip is growing and the grandfather tries to pull it up, but he can't. And the grandmother comes and the child comes and the dog comes and the cat comes and the mouse comes. And in the end, the ant helps and they pull this turnip out and they all have this great, wonderful feast. And so this is kind of like my, my joke on the turnip story where this couple is pulling. I mean, the, there's one, you see this, this line here, which is, my husband just told me it looks like it's pulling out the entrails of this other person, um, which you can't see right now, but in the big image you would. And this woman is pulling at these flowers, but clearly they don't need much pulling and he's interested in something entirely different. But I thought it would be interesting because later on we will be talking about turnips. This is a piece called High Tide Big Bow. And it is also part of the show. And it is, what you see is uh, the body of a woman without a head and then the head of a man. You see a little bit of body, but it's basically without a body. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking, of it as two bows, like you have the big bow that is the belt of this woman, but also his arms kind of form a bow. And I feel like it looks like he's loaded and he could just, you know, he could shoot his head up right into the skirt. So when this piece was done, I went to the Wadsworth and I was looking for, we were, I was looking in the archive for works that would um, be interesting for the show. So here we have the front of this piece and it is a drawing by the Kiriko. And it is the head of an old woman. And when Patty and I went into the archives to look for this drawing, we looked on the back and this skirt was on the back. Clearly the Kiriko didn't want to use this and use it as a, like a throwaway, but um, it seemed like it had this wonderful connection with the piece that I just made. And I think it's also this idea that it's kind of on a, on a spool where you could, the head of the man could become the head of the woman, her skirt become, could become his skirt. And the same with this piece of the Kirikos, which this old woman kind of, she was young at some point, but she could, you know, she could, she could become young again. And it also hopefully will tie in later with um, what we are talking about. And so if we could see the old, the, it's called old woman, the Kiriko called it that. And um, I just, I just initially really liked it because you do not see much of older, especially older women depicted in art. So, and I really thought it was beautiful. Oh, there we go. There we have the front and the back. And it says here, uh, head of old woman. So the back is obviously not titled and it was for a opera that the Kiriko designed. That is it. And I want to give it over to Sabrina right now, who is going to tell us the story. And I'm really excited to hear it. So please. Hi, that was incredible. I'm now, oh, I just want to talk about your work. Okay. My head is bursting with so many questions. Um, Christina, I actually, as um, you were showing um, the Sherco, um, and the back of the drawing, the drawing, it reminds me of those topsy-turvy dolls. Um, do you know those where it's a doll and they, they're, I have one of Little Red Riding Hood where it's Little Red Riding Hood. You turn it upside down, pull the skirt over the head and it's the wolf oh, and no. then pull or it's the grandmother and then pull the bonnet off the grandmother and it's the wolf um, to remind us that we're, you know, we're all part wolf, part grandmother. Mm -hmm. A little bit of everything. Oh, that's amazing. You'll have to yeah. show me. Part Little Red Riding Hood. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so thank you. That was just so beautiful. Um, and I love also, sorry, that you said, um, it looks very tiny, but it's actually very gigantic because I think that's sort of like the essence of fairy tales. Like it looks very tiny, you know, but when you keep, but it is very gigantic. Um, so I just love that you, you reminded us all of that. Um, so I'm actually gonna read um, 
a fairy tale called After Ever. And um, I recently almost completed um, my book Happily, um, which is still kind of in the editing stages, but um, this will actually be the very last piece in the book. Um, and each chapter deals with another fairy tale. And so there's sort of the, the, um, the fairy tale itself and then the memoir and the memoir kind of weaves through the fairy tale or the, the, the fairy tale weaves through the memoir. But in the final um, piece called um, After Ever, which is the piece that I'll read, um, everything has gone completely fairy tale. The world has just surrendered to fairy tale. And so what is my personal narrative um, has surrendered to the fairy tale. Um, and for any of you who have um, been tortured by fifth grade math, um, it starts there. First, it was basic multiplication, then decimals using grids, then variable expressions and coordinate planes. Then it was identifying three-dimensional figures viewed from different perspectives. By October, Noah asked if I could help him count vertices, edges, and faces. He had already found the volume of rectangular prisms. He had solved a whole page of multi-step word problems involving remainders, then asked me to check it. But how? I stared at his homework. There were missing operators. There were stem and leaf plots to interpret. Occasionally, there were tears in the page from too much erasing, holes where numbers should go. Each day, the problems got harder. Each day, there was more of them to solve. Dear Mrs. Bloom, I wrote, in problem number 18, there seemed to be no missing number, yet Noah was asked to find it. Dear Mrs. Bloom, there were more problems than Noah could solve in a single night. He did his best. Dear Mrs. Bloom, Noah did all his homework, then crumpled it up in despair. I smoothed it out as best I could. By winter, the problems Noah brought home left us both in tears. What even is this? I asked my husband. Neither of us knew. I turned the page upside down. If you hold it like this, it reminds me of that mythical sea creature with the tentacles. What is it called? Kraken, said my husband. Yes, I said, Kraken. A P on Noah's report card meant progressing, which is what Noah received. He was striving for an M, which meant to meet. He hadn't yet met what he was meant to meet, but Mrs. Bloom wrote in cheerful cursive that she knew he was well on his way to meet it. By late winter, the math seems to soften. Whereas before he was asked to evaluate numerical expressions with parentheses in different places, now he is just being asked to add. The numbers are large, practically swollen, but adding them is so much easier than what he had been asked to solve in the fall. Dear Mrs. Bloom, is this Noah's math homework? It seems much less challenging than before. Dear Mrs. Bloom, Noah tells me all the children are now adding whole numbers. Is this correct or is it only Noah? Dear Mrs. Bloom, can you tell me the pedagogical reasons for returning to the beginning? Two days after Noah's only homework is to subtract a thousand from a thousand, he comes home with just the number one. It is large enough to fill the entire page. A blade of grass. Noah colors it green. Outside, it seems mistier than usual. A castle rises in the distance. Is that a castle? I ask my husband. Sure looks like it, he says. A light from the tower flickers on once, then twice. A large crow lands in our yard. The neighbors stand on their porches, worried. What do you think is going on? One calls to the other. 
There is nothing about any of this on the news. The news is fading. Did you know, says Eli, the first evidence of the existence of the number one was a series of unified lines cut into bone? It was a baboon's bone, adds Noah. It's fibula, says Eli. 20,000 years ago in the Congo, someone was trying to keep track of something, but of what? Maybe miracles or food, says Eli. How do you know all this? They sound like their tongues are wrapped in old wool. That's what the children are learning now, says Noah. Just one. I told you, says Noah, it wasn't just me. You always think it's just me, but it's all of us. It's all of us, says Eli. Mama, says Eli, it's time for us to return to the essence. His eyes twinkle like the eyes of a 100-year-old man. I call my mother. I tell her about the one, how green it is now, how sometimes it even seems to sway. I tell her about what Eli and Noah told me about the marks on the bone, and I tell her about the castle, too. What? says my mother. I can't hear you. What's that in the background, I ask? Wolves, she says. I don't exactly know how to put this, I say to my husband, but doesn't it seem like we might be going fairy tale? Sure looks like it, he says. At night, I wake up to get a glass of water and the one is humming. It glistens on the kitchen counter. I put it in the belt of my robe like a sword. I sound on the ice the porch. Noah is up too. He heard a sound, he said, galloping. And when I looked out the bedroom window, he says, I saw a white horse staring up at me wearing a necklace of pink roses. I follow him to his bedroom and look out the window. Go back to sleep, I say. It's okay, I say. Nothing is there. Why are you wearing the one? asks Noah. I don't know, I say. It was humming, I say. Oh, I know, says Noah. It does that sometimes. I look out the window again. Our car is gone. I wake my husband up. The car is gone. Come look. He is flatter than I remember him. His beard, longer. He gets up and walks to the porch. See, I say, the car is gone. My husband lights his pipe. The world's a new color, says my husband. And where are the bro brothers? They're upstairs sleeping. Noah woke up. He said he saw a white horse wearing a necklace of pink roses. My husband takes a puff of his pipe and the smoke makes the shape of our sons holding hands. About a week before the one, I had hired a man to install a window in my office. I would be able to watch the sun slowly rise as I wrote. I would be able to see the sky. The man even promised me a ledge where I could put a small plant, a fern I imagined. But when the man cut a hole in the wall, it became obvious that in order for there to be any view at all, he'd, have, he'd also have to build a tunnel on account of our slanted roof and on account of where the wall was. And there was another reason I cannot remember. The effect, he said, as he sketched something, then erased something, then measured the wall again, would be like looking through a telescope. That doesn't sound good, I said. I'm sorry, he said. I looked at the hole in my wall. It reminded me of Noah's math homework where he erased too hard. The insides of my house were showing. I will patch it up, he said. It will be like none of this ever happened. I hold the one up to where the window couldn't be and the one glows. Did you see that? I say, but there's no one standing beside me to answer. I go downstairs and open the front door. It's all woods. Hello, I call out. A king walks sadly by dragging his velvet robes. The fog is thick. A boy flies over the trees. Whatever paint this town in Georgia was once covered in has been stripped away. The white horse with the necklace of pink roses steps out of the thick mist, shakes flakes of paint from its mane, and nuzzles the one Noah holds out like food. Doesn't it feel like we're becoming nobody and everybody, asks Eli, at the same time? It does, I say. It does, says Noah. The one is 
it's beginning to look less and less like the marks on a 20,000 year old bone and more like the bone itself. Don't let the horse eat it, I say. I would never dream of eating it, says the horse. It's for all of us, says the horse. My husband joins us. He lights his pipe. The world's a new color. And where are the brothers? We are right here, Papa, says Noah. We are right here, Papa, says Eli. My husband takes a puff from his pipe. The smoke spells every word of this fairy tale. How did you do that, Papa? Can I try? Can I? I call my mother. It feels like the world is bursting out of its skin. Here we go again, says my mother. I hear a soft howl. Wolves, I say? No, she says, but I know the wolves are there. What grades did Noah get in math, asks my mother. P, I say, for progressing. All this weighs heavily on my heart, says my mother. You don't sound like my mother, I say. Well, you don't sound like my daughter, says my mother. How are you calling me, I ask, inside a fairy tale? How are you answering, she asks. The one grows so big, my husband and sons and I carry it through the woods to a glittering lake. We slide it into the water like a raft and climb on. The horse and my mother and the wolves and the neighbors and Mrs. Bloom and the man who cut a hole in my wall then patched the hole up and the sad king and the flying boy and the baboon and the crow climb on too. There is room for all of us. There is even room for you. The one grows bigger and lowers as the lake rises. The lake is now just a drop of water at the center of the one. And we are specks, pencil marks on paper, waiting to be solved. I wish we were in an auditorium now. <laughs> <laughs> this is beautiful. Thank um, you so much. So yeah, so, um, so that's, that's a fairy tale. And actually, you know, I think, I mean, maybe we could start, I was thinking um, with this idea of um, the way the fairy tale sort of um, will allow for um, sort of like shows its threads. Like I, I kept thinking about your, um, I, I just, I, I've been looking at your weavings and as I look at them, I think, oh my God, if, if I came upon um, a piece of art inside a fairy tale, like this is what I would come upon. And I think it's because there's something about your work. I mean, as soon as I saw your work, I I felt um, just totally at home. And I think there's something about your work that um, it does exactly what the fairy tale does, which is like reminds us of this, you know, the oral tradition reminds us of how things can be woven together, but also um, 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 or, or spoken aloud, but also stitched into the ground. Um, you, you had said as um, you were doing your talk that everything talks to each other, but everything is at the same time kept completely separate. Um, and I keep like, I was looking at some images of your studio and I want so badly it's like, come to your studio and like look and like pull the tapestry and like look behind it you know like I feel I, I just um that there's something um that you do that keeps reminding us that um you know the story itself is kind of like filled with um uh, stray threads and undergarments and um, like kind of hidden spaces. Um, I think so. this is what really attracts me in your work as well. Just the story you were telling, I feel like it all has these, when you're talking about the thread, I feel like it's your life, your life with your family. And then all of a sudden these things weave in and out of your lives. And I, I was, um, 
thinking also right now when you were saying you were to like to be in my studio, I was thinking of the fairy in Sleeping Beauty. How she's, you know, he, she hides behind the, she hides behind the tapestry. And I really think it's quite nice when you see the tapestries from the back where the illusion is completely gone. And I don't, I, for me, it's not mm. completely gone because now I'm thinking of paintings where you look at the back of a painting, there's just canvas usually, except with the de mm. Kirico. But um, with the tapestry, you really see how it's made in the back. It's just a big mess of just loose threads everywhere. And um, so it, it made me think of that. But then, yeah, your story just now with the one also kind of reminding me of a thread weaving through. And um, what, what, what I was gonna say is how we were talking a few days ago about just things that happen in real life that then kind of find their way into, into your artwork, but also they kind of make your life better. And you were saying something and I thought that was so beautiful. You were saying how if you wouldn't acknowledge these things, which in, in the case was the nail, which we will show soon enough, that um, it would make life just like this rut. And I think that is very much true. And it, it, um, it shows in your tales too. And I think when I'm reading your stories, I, I feel like I open up myself to, to let more things in that occur. And I, I see more connections. And yeah, so maybe, I I thought, maybe, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, well, well, maybe I'll tell that, should, should I tell this, I'll tell this story and then we can kind of go yeah. from there. <laughs> yeah. So um, Christina and I had a meeting to sort of talk about what we were going to talk about. So this is, okay, so right now the talk that we're giving is like the front of the tapestry, except that we're going to show like the back of the talk with the straight, the straight th threads or like how the talk came to be. And um, I ended up not being able to get onto the Zoom meeting or I got onto the Zoom meeting for a second um, all flummoxed because my son, I had gotten a call from the nurse's office that my son had stepped on a rusty nail at school and I needed to go pick him up. So I was sort of like all over the place. And I guess right before we had this talk, Christina had been scanning um, this um, fairy tale here, I have it right here. She had been scanning the Turnip Princess, um, the Schoenworth's um, Turnip Princess. And the Turnip Princess is this fairy tale um, that is about a nail and that, and the nail um, is stuck inside of a, a cave. Um, and um, there's, a um a prince who is um one day on his way to the woods as all princes always are in fairy tales they're either like entering or exiting the woods um and um he comes upon um a bear and um a very old woman um, or a very old woman who who has with her a pet bear um and the and one day um, the bear and the prince are alone and the prince and um, the bear says to the prince, if you, there's a rusty nail inside of the cave and if you pull the nail out of the cave, um, I will, um, I will find you, uh, um, I will, I will um, turn into a king and, um, and then if you take the nail and you put it underneath a turnip, um, you will find the most beautiful maiden of all, or I will find you the most beautiful maiden of all. Is that right, Christina? Am I messing it up a little bit? No, okay. I think that's right. Okay. And so you have this like, so, so we see the spell broken, like we see one spell broken inside of the fairy tale, right? Like the, so he pulls the nail out um, um, the nail flies out of the prince's 
hand. Um, and then, you know, the, the, um, so of course he doesn't, he can't, he, he doesn't get it to the turn up yet. So it's only a sort of like a half broken spell. And what I thought was, sorry, I was just going to interrupt up because I thought that was really funny because the nail falls out of his hands and he kind of like, or I imagine him sort of falling and he cuts, he falls into a bush and he just cuts up his hands and his legs and he looks at the blood and he faints. Oh, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> And, then he falls and he falls asleep and he falls asleep for so long he he grows the very long beard <laughs> right. anyway, so. so um and then um and then when he awakes he like finds himself um luckily right next to a turn up right which he can then um um uh is that I don't think he doesn't have the nail he just I think he falls asleep next to it and when he wakes up this turnip is a bowl oh right with the indentation of an acorn which I would love to talk about because I do not understand why this is the indentation of an acorn inside of it is a nail and then there is this little figure this princess with hair and fingers and feet and so he has the nail. Right. Yes. And and so and then kind of I think one of the most beautiful, very strange things about the fairy tale um, is that um, the the um, the prince then um, ends up tugging the nail, putting the nail back into the cave, right? And so we're sort of stuck inside of this fairy tale that goes half spell where, where the world is, um, where the, this, the spell is partially broken and partially still intact, um, which I can't, and I keep thinking, and, and, and the way that we know that is that the bear becomes like half man um, and the maiden is, you know, half maiden, half very old woman. Um, and so we get to kind of see this world that is kind of um, showing um, uh, these multiple faces um, or, um, um, and it's, it's showing its magic and its um, lack of magic. And I, I've been trying to think of like a fairy tale where that happens, where we could, where we feel as though we're kind of like seeing um, you know, the undergarments um, um, of the story itself. No, I can't think of anything either. And I, I just, I think also what's so nice about this is he has this um, autonomy at all of a sudden he goes like, well, I'll take this nail and I put it back in there and I'll see. And um, he, he kind of works it and goes, well, <laughs> this is, and, and he understands and he goes, oh, I see. And he, he pulls it out all the way. I don't, then he throws it away, which to me is, I would have kept that nail you know, like you did. But um, I, uh, I think that's what's really interesting about it is that he, I think he, he you know, he, first he faints and he kind of doesn't, doesn't understand. And all of a sudden he goes, no. I'm going to see and he still doesn't trust a woman which I thought was curious but yeah so and I think that's I think both of our work has this has exactly that nail in it in so many ways yeah <laughs> and and also then there's something about that prince kind of pushing the nail back in and then pulling it back out and the bear kind of like um sort of suggests that he does that. I mean, so there's a sort of like um, a, a kind of like fair, the feral um, nature of like messing with worlds, right? Like where you're, you're, you're pushing the nail in and then pulling the nail back out, you know, to, to, um, to mess with these worlds, but it's also like suddenly the prince is, is the writer, you know, the prince is the, the yeah. artist. You know, um, the prince is, is the one who can kind of, um, you know, and I, I looked at like the beginnings of your, your tapestries, you know, like how they, how they begin. And it, it does seem like you're kind of like 
pushing the nail in, pulling the nail out, pushing it in, pulling it out. And like, even that, that movement um, is also like, where we like reach into our personal narratives, right? And we find a kind of like um, magic to attach to it. I mean, and this was something that we were talking about earlier where, um, you know, there are times where I feel like if I didn't find a way to attach some magic to the story of like, let's say for example, like my son stepping on a rusty nail and getting a call from the nurse's office. Like if it's attached to nothing, right? Like if it's attached to no significance, if that, if there's just the personal narrative, like without the art, I just would be sad all the time. It's like yeah. the mask thing where the mask thing would just be about the progress and getting harder and it's getting a little, a little bit harder and even a little bit, it's exactly like that. Yeah, it's just, Kind of beating time. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to ask you um, about sort of your relationship to the fairy tale. Just you know, um, I know we already talked about this a little bit, but just for just so that I'm not being completely greedy, um, just if you could talk a little bit about maybe um, you know how you came upon the fairy tale. I, 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 yeah, we did talk about it a little bit. And for me, it really was, I mean, I grew up with fairy tales to some degree, but when I think back, what I'm left with is just these really static images and not necessarily the tales. And um, I think through my work, I have been always asked about, you know, what fairy tales are you reading? Where's this coming from? Is this Swiss? Is this, coming from the Grimm's and, and I thought to myself, well, something must, there must be something there because I, um, that is how I, it, it's the culture I grew up with in, but I was not aware of it. And um, I have just started reading them. And I feel like what I really like, because oftentimes I have troubles reading stories that are long and they have, you know, one thing happens after the other, but it's, it's kind of much more so abstract than in a fairy tale where you have one image, two image, you repeat it, one image to it, you repeat it. And you could put just everything into one big bowl or one big turnip bowl and shake it around. It would still make sense. And so I think that's what, what I ended up really realizing that it's, it's, it's a big bowl of things and you can just pick things out and put them together however you want to. And it still has a lot of, um, uh, like, like power to it and I think so if you think about that nail again where you pull it in and pull it out and you have like half half of the person showing or half of the bear showing or that that is the same that is in my uh in that one tapestry we were showing earlier called high tide I think it, it can be all these things at once it's very clear and at the same time totally unclear mm -hmm. and I think that's where I like to be with my work too where it's extremely precise but at the same time it makes no sense if that makes any sense totally. yeah <laughs> so. I love that like I love that sense of it can be everything at once um because I really like came to writing through the prose poem, which is just, you know, it's, it's just a little box. Um, and I loved how, and in that way, I feel like it, it, it has a lot of like fairy tale components where it's kind of like a snapshot or it's like looking at, you know, a painting or a tapestry and like kind of you can move back and you can come closer, um, but you can see it all in a single breath um and, and how, i think yeah no i just when you're talking just i wanted to also ask you then how how did how you came to the fairy tale as well through starting with prose poems yeah i um i will say like i did not read fairy tales as a child at all i had a book of fairy tales um on my shelf 
It had this salivating crocodile on it wearing a brown corduroy vest. And it, I hated it. I hated, I hated it. And I was scared to open it. And I was certain if it, I opened it, like that crocodile would eat me. <laughs> and so now I'm like, I want, I started trying to find this book of fairy tales that I never opened as a child. And um, I asked my mother about it, who is like, you know, my, who is my poetic foil. And she claims that the book never existed, um, which is sort of, <laughs> um, yeah, of course. And, of course. <laughs> I'm, I, but she just said, I'm, I'm imagining things. Um, and so the, so, and I couldn't, I Google, I like tried to figure like 1980 something like crocodile. If anybody know, if anyone out there could find this book for me, um, you know, I will be forever grateful, but I could, I, I never opened it. What I did, um, um, I grew, grew up Orthodox Jewish and I spent, um, most of my childhood reading the Torah um, and reading, and that was my favorite subject by far. And, um, you know, I just read about miracles all day. And like, you know, um, and in many ways, like the Torah was my collection of fairy tales. And that was really kind of how like um, I built my, I mean, that was like my real form of 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 reading as a kid I was I I just and and I I would read the stories over and over again we would study them over and over again you know from fourth grade fifth grade sixth grade you would just keep returning to the stories and so that kind of like act the the reading as both like a kind of prayer and a form of repetition right like you know you know how everything's going to end. Um, you know what's going to happen. You know the characters, but you just keep reading the stories over and over again. And that, to me, is the only way I really can understand anything, I think. And I mean, and maybe like when you're going, when you're saying like you have your images, right? And you can move the images around. Yeah. Um, um, but you know, it's sort of like, the mother, the sister, you know, the, the mother, the father, the sister, the brother, um, you know, the tree, the bird, and you just keep kind of rearranging yes. um, that it's, it kind of goes back. There's this poll, one of my favorite writers of all time is Bruno Schultz. Um, and he talks, he's a Polish writer um, who was murdered during the Holocaust. And he writes about this idea of like the single knot and how every artist, and this is kind of perfect, Christina, like I feel like it was he, when he wrote this, he was like thinking of your of your weavings because he he writes how every artist has a single knot and their whole lives you're just kind of like working the knot and working the knot, you know, and you're just returning to it over and over again. And you can't, and, and, and like- Sometimes May, it feels tighter and tighter too. Tighter and tighter. Totally, that's what he says. He says, and it gets tighter and tighter. <laughs> and it's sort of like, may we never understand that. Like, that's like, for me, may I never understand what I'm doing is my- oh, I agree. And also just, I'm thinking again about the story you just read about going back to the one, like it felt like such a relief when it became this fleshy thing, this number one, and it just, now you can actually look at it and not just having to worry about keeping up with life. And you, you had this really beautiful um, story and you break it, you fix it. There's this little um, part about, I think I, I might pronounce this wrong, it's Tim Tum, and where the light, where God leaves, some little light in a vessel and the vessel breaks and then everybody's just trying to put this and it, it reminds me of that too very much where it, yeah you just try to contain what you have or like understand it or pulling that knot yeah 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 I mean yeah it's it's like according to like you know Jewish mysticism like the failed 
phase of Genesis where, you know, um, like the creator departs from the creator's creation, but like right before God departs, God goes and like takes all of his light and shoves it into these vessels and then, and then departs. But then like the, the vessels can't hold God's light. And so they break and shatter every, the vessels break and shatter. And so we're sort of, we live in this world sort of, you know, covered in, in, in broken light. And we spend our lives just wandering around collecting it, like trying, you know, trying to make some kind of sense, sense of it. Um, And in a way, you know, like the fairy tale, you know, is also, it's, it's a, it's a glass vessel, you know, it kind of like holds, it, it holds the light and like the, the weaving, you know, your weavings, it's like, it's a vessel, like where you're, you're sort of, you're holding some sense of like, you know, human experience. Um, So when you were thinking just because of vessel, because to me, this is still a total mystery. So when you're looking at this turnip, what, what do you think you're looking at this turnip, turnip and this turnip turns into a vessel and has a, an acorn imprint and there is this maiden. <laughs> is that one of those things that we could try to figure out and never get anywhere? Or Now I'm wondering, I'm trying now, see now I'm wondering, now we need our, tra- like now we need the translators because I'm wondering if it's like. Oh, I should read it in German. I, it's, right. It was, Okay, I, yeah. <laughs> I feel like acorn may just be seed. That's what I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah. But now exactly. we need this. Thing. But it becomes very sexual too, I guess. Totally, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, here, this is it. He found a big white turnip growing in the field, fields right next to him, stuck the branch with the red flower into the turnip and fell fast asleep. Of course, like there's all this like constant penetration, like all over this story, right? So then- You know what comes to my mind? I'm sorry, maybe this is not appropriate for the daytime, but the acorn, we call that in German, you call that the, it's the top of a penis. So in my this is where maybe, This is where I need to know like what the original what the original is i will look at this thing the other thing about this fairy tale that we were talking about is that it was collected you know by this um you know by by um von schoenworth um but and he collected like tons and tons and tons of fairy tales and then it wasn't until 2012 where um erica eichlinsier and of course, like she has seer in her name, which is yeah. so perfect, like found and, com- you know, these boxes, these old box, these, these, these boxes in, a, in, a, in an archive in Germany of unopened, you know, th- these unopened boxes, like just filled with fairy tales. And Grimm said, like, nowhere in the whole of Germany has anyone collected more completely, um, leaving so few traces which I also find like, you know, really interesting in terms of storytelling. And I'm kind of like obsessed with this, this idea of like when stories start like rising to the surface, why they rise to the surface, like after being hidden for, you know, you know, a century, it, they, they're, their founds like I I just I there's this sense of like okay for some reason you know like in 2012 it was necessary for all of us you know to to, for these fairy tales to sort of like come back into the light um and I'm you know and and so there's something about like working inside of like space of fairy tales that feels like you're working in shadows all the time where you have these stories that are kind of flickering in and out of the light you know like where they fall away they're remembered again they're forgotten 
um, they're retold, they're reimagined, they're sanitized, um, you know, then they're, um, they're, they're undone somehow and then returns back into the circulation. Um, but how do you think of work? I didn't really understand the idea of working in shadow. I don't understand what you mean by that. Because I think there's so many parts of like any fairy tale that like, you know, because of all of the retellings that there are okay, these yes. parts of them that are that end up being forgotten. And then you can kind of like reach into the fairy tale, pull, pull it out, remember it, forget it again, but it's always somehow still there in our collective consciousness. And how they are appropriated. And then I, I'm thinking oftentimes I've been trying to figure out the whole Disney thing and uh, just how they are being appropriated. And then you still, you feel like oh, there's something missing. I think you still see this, this, there's, this is not the whole story. And I, I think that's also quite interesting yeah. that that is so evident. It's not yeah, there's there. There's always something in the shot. There's always something forgotten, you know, there, um, yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. So we have fewer than 10 minutes left. So I thought maybe we could take a few questions um that were in the chat so the first is for you sabrina um and it was about the story you read and um they were wondering what triggered this story in you well this kind of goes back to um you know that um i mean honestly it was the torture of fifth grade math I had, there was some, there was an absolute, um, I, and this sense of, on my part, like complete and utter bewilderment and this the endless feeling of like, the ground is coming out from under me. And whenever I get inside of that place, I mean, I think that's the place where I start trying to find I start kind of reaching out and trying to pull little pieces of story and I put them into my notebook and um, I arrange and rearrange them somehow, like hoping that I can like stay afloat. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that sounds dramatic, but it really, it's really, really awful. I promise. <laughs> no, I, I actually understand. <laughs> it can become so... Uh... All or nothing. Uh, and, and the next question I think could, could be for both of you. And does magic inform how you perceive reality or does reality become magic to you? Mm. Uh, for me, it's both. Mm. I mean, this is a very quick answer, I guess. I think it comes and goes. And if, if you, I don't know, I love it. I love to find weird things and things that connect and all of a sudden you have a whole, whole universe that seems to somehow make sense. I don't know about you. Yeah, I feel that, I mean, I think I try to keep my eyes very wide open looking, you know, um, I guess it's really, I think maybe, um, when we say magic, I think we mean like significance and beauty, you know, I think we mean, um, you know, and, and, um, and for me, like the fairy tale, like fairy is like the, is fata, you know, um, uh, which is fate, um, but it's fate rooted in magic. And I, like, I, I, I can have the fate, like I'm okay with the fate. But I need, I, you know, um, and I'm, I'm okay with the story like rooted in fate, but it needs to be lifted by some kind of magic, um, you know, because otherwise, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, oh, someone, uh, Sabrina, suggested that maybe the book was Lyle, Lyle Crocodile by Bernard Weber. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. I know that story. It's not, it's, I was in, okay. It was an anthology of fairy tales. Mm -hmm. So I know, and it was a, it was a, I had said to my husband, it's a crocodile 
in a brown corduroy vest and he was salivating. And so my husband said, are you sure it wasn't an alligator as if like, you know, like to, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, but it, I kind of feel like it's, it's a book, you know, I, I, it's like, I have to look for it forever. And like, also maybe never find it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and now I have a question for Christina. Um, could you talk a little bit about the imagery in Sepulchre and uh, also about your creative process? Um, I'm trying to see, I feel like- um, Pull up the image again or- Yeah, it's also, it's kind of oftentimes for me when I make something, I it goes into my subconscious. So it's kind of disappears into a little bit of a place that I don't have access to. Maybe just like that um, crocodile fairy, fairy tale book. But um, I think initially what I was um, interested in is um, mourning and how people grieve and how people um, just go. Because I, I lost my father and I think that's when I started thinking about the more I would do things with my hands, the more I kind of felt comfortable and I could kind of work with the idea that there is a absence that is completely inexplicable to me. And I thought that with this repetition and the kind of getting familiar with something that that, that's, that, that was kind of a beautiful thing. And so I started looking at mourning um samplers and that's what started it all and then it kind of it just blew up mm -hmm. from there <laughs> so that yeah uh, it reminds me of like in terms of like the morning ritual um you know and and the idea the, the sort of the like, idea of like weaving you know like kind of holding things like kind of pulling things back down you know like holding them um there's um, a Jewish morning ritual where you take pieces of broken pottery and you place it on the eyes of the dead um, to sort of like hold, hold the body down. Um, yeah. It's just such a, uh, just the feeling of it too. It's, I'm thinking of it, 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 it kind of calms also the idea of, of you you know, having to die at some point, just this, this weight on yourself, but then also being able to, to give that to someone. That's, yeah, it's nice. And then it's like, you know, and then it goes back to sort of like the broken vessels, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we end up being light. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Um, Sabrina, what do you think is the biggest challenge of moving an oral tradition, like a fairy tale to written or artistic medium I guess this is for both of you so well one actually one thing I wanted to say Christina that I noticed is like you have all these like open mouths you know <laughs> and you have like these speech bubbles but then you have these the figures are like inside of the speech bubbles like these pregnant you know like these pregnant speech bubbles like filled with with figures and so like to me, that's like Christina's answer to that question, which was like <laughs> totally genius, like just absolute, like all just, um, you know, how to take an oral tradition, right? And like um, um, hold it, hold it in place. Um, I, I mean, in a way that might, might be something I'm gonna need to like surrender and figure something else out you know, I, I use the word says like, like crazy. I mean, everything like, you know, she says, he says, my husband says, my mother says, 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 and there's this kind of repetition of says everywhere where like, to the point where dialogue, I almost imagine as like physical objects, you know, that are kind of like, um, dropping to the dropping to the grounds and like you know and they have this weight and there's that um but I'm also noticing that I might I may need a a new, a new I, I mean personally I love it and I, 
I love this that that it comes as that, and especially when I hear it or I hear it or read it when it comes from your children, because I think children have this weird ability to just, I mean, you, you call it dropping a bomb, but it's, it really is this, it comes out of nowhere and it's just whoops. And sometimes it's, it's almost, um, it throws you out of your balance. It has this, it's really potent. And I think it is physical. And I love that, that you, it's, he says, she says, I, I love it because that's, I feel like that's my life. I hear everyone from everywhere talking and for me, leave it in there. I think it's, and, well, it, it makes it so real, you know? Well, honestly, I mean, these essays really came, you know, I really started the column in many ways for the Paris Review because I, my children were saying things to me and I was like, if I don't write this stuff down, like I'll forget everything. I will just forget everything. Um, and and that was like a big impulse behind the writing too, was just like, because I knew I would forget. Um, Giving way to what, the, yeah, it's, it's I, I, I think it's really, it works really well. And I think it also brings to mind my, what my kids tell me or what my mother tells me, or it, it really kind of emphasizes what I go through when I read your work. It's, it's, it's the really- title of your, um, um, So the title of your uh, series is Happily. And I assume that's a reference to Happily Ever After. And did you come up with that title? Yeah. It, um, and then the last, the last essay-ish chapter, now, now they're chapters, they once were essays. I don't even know what they're called anymore, but so the second to last piece in the book is um, ever after, and then this last piece is after ever. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, um, one last question um, that um, someone, um, mentions B, that the flickering aspect and shadowy nature of fairy tales reminds me of dreams. Mm. Do you see a connection? I want to say yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like the thing about the fairy tale is that um, they're, you know, I think the reason and this was something we had talked about also, you know, like Bruno Bettelheim talks about the fact that like the fairy tale is so important because it's like these, you know, again, using the word vessels, I don't think Bruno Bettelheim used the word vessels, but it's like these, you know, um, it's a way to hold like all of our, you know, fears and, and um, you know, desires and um, sort of like in their most, their sort of like hottest, states um and sort of at in their most like feverish states so you know we're worried that um you know um, um our mother doesn't love us enough but then you get to fully realize the mother not only like you know not loving us enough but like literally sending the child out you know into into the woods um um, and, ab and, and abandoning the child. And so there is something in that way that the fairy tale, I mean, th that in a way is the dream, right? It's the dream that like holds us sort of in our, in our, in, in our, um, um, I think like most feverish states, um, I mean, sometimes we don't understand it. Like, again, like, why is there an acorn in the turnip? Like, I had this dream the other night and there was like an acorn in the turnip bowl, but like, you know, um, we'll eventually figure it out. Yeah, it would make sense. But it's also, I, I also, um, sometimes I think dreams are this thing where I, I have this thing when I'm really anxious, I imagine all the worst things that could happen so that they don't happen. <laughs> so I think there's like a weird superstitious element to a dream. But then there's also, um, I had this dream and I haven't had it for a long time and I wish it would come back, where I would get really anxious and I would go to bed and then there was the hugger and I don't know who the hugger is, it's no face, nothing, but 
he would just hug me all night. And it was just this really beautiful thing. And I would wake up and I'd feel very happy. And um, so I think dreams can also do that. And I think fairy tales also can do that. Oh my God, it's There's... the weaver, the weaver and the hugger. <laughs> So I think that's a beautiful point (laughs) to end on. Um, We could talk for another hour, or at least I could listen to you talk for another hour. I know. I'm going to go to Christina's house right now. Anytime. You can come right through that that light there. (laughs) That's I like that light. (laughs) But this has been such a treat and a wonderful program. And I just think um, the two of you getting together is just serendipity I mean it's just and perfect yes know? I'm so it's happy total... that you agree to this I'm a big fan so thank you very much Sabrina I and thank you a, Patty I, I, complete honor and thank you for like the beauty you bring to this world Christina and thank, thank you. you Patty um and thank you so God's worth and yeah it's just amazing